Hello ladies and gentlemen, this will be a talk on obstetric complications during labor. Now earlier I did a talk on delayed labor, which is I guess a complication of labor, but here we're going to be actually talking about the physical things that go wrong during labor. So a little bit different, and this is very high yield for the test. If you haven't already, please consider subscribing to my Patreon page at www.patreon.com forward slash pwbmd. You can click on the link below in the description or the little I button on the top right hand corner of the video. Uh, just consider chipping in a dollar a month. It really goes a long way to help keep these videos free. Uh, this week I'm going to start putting together some, uh, some case studies that will really be of use to you for practice or for on the test. Um, I'm going to try and make these as high yield as possible. They'll be short case studies uh, and be condensing some really important information. And I'll put those up every week. If you subscribe and chip in a buck a month, uh, you'll have access to those. Thank you very much in advance, by the way. All right, so we are going to talk about four things here. Very, very high yield for the test. I guarantee you step two or step three, you will get a question on at least one of these. You'll need to know how these are diagnosed, how they're treated, and the complications that can arise. So we're going to talk about prolapsed umbilical cord first, then we'll talk about shoulder dystocia, uterine rupture, and obstetrical laceration. All of these have complications uh, that you need to be aware of. So the prolapsed umbilical cord is a protrusion of the umbilical cord ahead of or alongside the presenting part of the fetus. Now a lot of people when they think of prolapsed umbilical cord they think well this is easy to diagnose because prolapsed umbilical cord means that the umbilical cord is coming outside the cervix and I can feel it and I can see it and that's easy to diagnose. No, it's not. As a matter of fact, most of the time that you see a prolapsed umbilical cord you won't actually be able to see it you'll be able to pick it up perhaps on fetal heart tracing or on ultrasound, but you might not be able to see it. Maybe you'll be able to feel it, but if you see it, you have a serious emergency on hand. Okay, so let's see how these prolapsed umbilical cords can show up. So there's three different types of prolapse umbilical cord. The first is the occult prolapse. So with the occult prolapse, the umbilical cord is prolapsing alongside the head of the fetus. So you're not going to be able to feel this because when you feel, your fingers are going up here, and you'll feel the presenting part of the fetus, which is the head or the, you know, whatever, however the, the fetus is presenting. We're going to say here it's the head. Okay, so you'll, feel, you'll be able to feel fetal head, but you won't be able to feel the cord because the cord is alongside the fetus. But why might this be a problem? Well, if you look here, this is actually a cross section, but this umbilical cord is, rather than alongside the baby's body, where you have a little bit more room, the umbilical cord is wedged between the fetal head and the wall of the uterus. And if it's between something hard and something contracting, then you're going to cut off, you're going to seriously cut off blood flow to the, umbil to the umbilical cord. And remember that this is the only way that the baby's getting oxygen. So oxygen is coming in through the placenta, going to the baby through the umbilical cord. And if this is, if, if this is compressed too much or too long, then you're going to have problems with the baby getting oxygen. Heart rate's going to drop and all that bad stuff. Okay, so this is a occult prolapse. You can't feel it, you can't see it. You're only going to be able to pick it up on fetal heart tracing. Remember, constriction of the umbilical cord, compression of the umbilical cord will give you a certain tracing on your, your fetal heart monitor. Okay, now this is a funic presentation. So funic comes from the Latin uh, funiculus umbilicus, which is the Latin word for umbilical cord. Uh, but funic presentation means that the presenting part, the, the furthest out part of the fetus, the most advanced part of the fetus, is actually the umbilical cord. Okay, so if you were to feel this, you would be able to feel maybe some of the fetal head, but you'd be able to feel umbilical cord. Now this is different, I want to point this out right now, this is different from a vasa previa. Remember, a vasa previa, you'd also be able to feel umbilical cord, but there's a difference. With vasa previa, you have, you, have, uh, you have a placenta on either side of the uterus and then a, uh, a vein that comes out uh, between the two 
sides of the placenta. With a vasa previa, if the mom changes positions, that vein is going to stay in the same spot. With a funic presentation, if the mom changes position, the umbilical cord will move. Okay, so when you feel it, the with a funic presentation, they'll feel it'll feel similar to a vasa previa. But the difference is that a with a prolapsed umbilical cord, it's going to be mobile, and with a vasa previa, it's going to be fixed. Okay, so this is a funic presentation. The umbilical cord is the presenting part. Now, if the membranes rupture, let's say you have a funic presentation and the membranes rupture, what's going to happen with the cord? The cord is going to come out, and now you have an overt prolapse. This is what people think of when they think of prolapse umbilical cord. This you'll be able to not only feel, but you may actually even be able to see it if it's coming out far enough. So contrast that with the occult prolapse, which you can't see or feel. Okay. So, um, move on here. Okay. So, let's say you can't feel it or see it. You have a, an occult prolapse. Uh, maybe you don't even know. So, mom is in labor. She's having contractions. And you see this pattern. So, what do we have here? Where's our baseline? 150. If you haven't watched my video, by the way, on fetal heart tracing, I highly recommend you do that. So our baseline is 150. You have a couple accelerations here. That's good. But what's happening with the contractions? You're getting these drops. What kind of decelerations are these? These are late decelerations? No. Okay. They, they start after the, the decelerations start after the contraction starts and end after the contraction ends but it's not a late deceleration by virtue of the fact that these are abrupt drops. Remember uh, that uh, late decelerations are, are very gradual and they are very significant drops in heart rate. So with a late deceleration, yes, it starts after the contraction starts and ends after the contraction ends, but they're very shallow and very gradual. This is a variable deceleration. Variable decelerations are, are abrupt and they are, they're very significant. Okay, so variable deceleration. Now, what kind of variable deceleration is this? Is this mild, moderate, or severe? These are severe variable decelerations. So remember, a severe variable deceleration is where the heart rate drops by at least 60 beats per minute, or it drops below 70 beats per minute. So in this case, both happen. So you're going from 150 to 30 here. That's a drop of 120. That's more than enough to meet the criteria of a late or of a of a uh, severe variable. Uh, and it's also dropping below 70. So they fit both criteria, but it only needs to fit one. So this is a severe variable deceleration. Severe variables and lates are a sign that you need to do something. You need to uh, in, in many cases, you're going to be doing a C-section. But when you see severe variable decelerations, uh, this is a sign. Any kind of variable de deceleration is a sign of umbilical cord compression, but severe variable decelerations are commonly seen in umbilical cord prolapse. Okay, so uh, we'll move on here. The most common reason for a prolapsed umbilical cord is a rupture of membranes when the presenting part is not engaged. So why is that? Let's go back and look here. So if here we have an engaged head, okay, so that's good. But let's say the head was not engaged, so the head is going to be further up. It's not up against the, uh, the, the edge of the uterus on the cervix. If the head was not engaged, there's going to be amniotic fluid in between the head and the cervix. And so when the membranes rupture, now you're going to have potential space. And that potential space is going to be filled by something. Now, ideally, it would be the fetal head or whatever fetal presenting part it is. But if the umbilical cord comes out first, then you're going to have prolapse. So essentially, if the fetal head or the fetal presenting part is not engaged, then it's going to be a race between the fetal presenting part and the umbilical cord. And if the umbilical cord gets out first, then you have a prolapse. Okay? So that's why we always want the fetal uh, 
presenting part to be engaged so that that part is filling up the potential space and that part is going to now be the presenting part and you don't have the umbilical cord going out around it. Risk factors. Male presentation. If you have male presentation, you're more likely to not be presenting, well, you're not presenting properly, and so there's going to be more room for the umbilical cord to sneak around when you have rupture of membranes. Amniotomy as well. If the presenting part is not engaged and you do an amniotomy, big problem. External cephalic version. Why? Because the umbilical cord may be manipulated in such a point where you can cause an occult prolapse. Fetal anomalies because of abnormalities of the fetal body. Cord abnormalities. Polyhydramnios. Why that? Well, if you have more fluid, you have more potential space. If you have more potential space, there's going to be more room for the umbilical cord to come up. Multiple gestation. Just because there's going to be more, uh, there's more... Uh, fluid, and there's two umbilical cords, spontaneous rupture of membranes, PPROM, and grand multiparity. What do we do to manage a prolapsed umbilical cord? Well, if you, I mean, if you see a prolapsed umbilical cord, the first thing that may come to mind is to put the cord back in. Absolutely not. As a matter of fact, you should never touch the cord. Uh, because, remember, what's inside the cord? It's veins and arteries. And whenever you touch veins and arteries, you're going to have a reflex vasospasm. And that's going to cause them to constrict, and it's going to reduce blood flow to the baby or away from the baby. And that is a big problem. So don't touch the cord. Don't try to put it back into the uterus. Don't do anything like that. What you do want to do is put the mom in a knee chest position and hold the fetal head in an elevated position. Meanwhile, mom's going to be sent in for emergency section. You're going to continue holding the fetal head while another doctor is doing the c-section. So this is always going to require an emergent c-section. Mom's not going to be delivering the baby. The longer you go without delivering that baby, the higher the risk of, of, of fetal death there is. So the uh, another risk factor that I didn't really put in here because it's kind of secondary is a uterine anomaly. So if the mom has a uterine anomaly, remember that she's going to be at risk for male presentation. And if you have male presentation, you're at risk for prolapse umbilical cord. So when you're doing your obstetric gynecologic history, when a mom comes in for her first prenatal visit, you want to uh, make sure that you know whether or not she has a congenital uterine anomaly. And she may not know, or maybe she does know. But that's always good to know in advance. Okay, next we'll talk about shoulder dystocia. Very, very, very common. So this is very useful for the test. Shoulder dystocia is an impaction of the anterior shoulder behind the maternal pubic symphysis. So in other words, the anterior shoulder is getting stuck. And if it gets stuck, you can't deliver it. If you can't deliver it, you can run into problems because the baby can go into distress. So our goal with shoulder dystocia is to get that anterior shoulder dislodged because once you deliver the anterior shoulder, the posterior shoulder comes out quite easily. So one of the things that you see with shoulder dystocia is something called the turtle sign. And this gets put into vignettes a lot. So the turtle sign, what it means is so the baby's head is delivered already and you have the shoulders and the anterior shoulder is wedged up behind the maternal pubic symphysis. And what happens is when the uterus contracts, the baby's head comes out a little bit more, but because that shoulder is wedged, it can't come out all the way. And when the contraction stops, the baby's head comes back in. So it's kind of like a turtle poking its head out the shell and then bringing it back in. Okay, so that's the turtle sign. Baby's head comes out with contraction, kind of goes back in a little bit when the contraction ends. Risk factors. Anything that makes the baby big. Okay, so fetal macrosomia. Maternal diabetes. Well, we know that that makes a big baby. Post-term pregnancy. Well, that makes a big baby because the baby is more developed. Prolonged second stage, probably because the other way around. Shoulder dystocia is going to cause a prolonged second stage. Operative vaginal delivery and history of shoulder dystocia. So if mom's given birth to other babies with shoulder dystocia, there's a risk that she's going to give birth to another baby with shoulder dystocia. Another one that I didn't put on here is maternal obesity. So how do we manage this? You see this a lot, and so this is what you're going to do. There's something called McRoberts Maneuver. So 
Okay, so that's fetal dystocia, or shoulder dystocia. Okay, so this is Mick, uh, Mick Roberts' maneuver. So what you're doing with Mick Roberts' maneuver is you're taking the knees and you're flexing them up towards the mom's shoulder. Okay? And what this is going to do is it's going to rotate the symphysis pubis towards the head. It's cephalad rotation of, of, the, uh, of the symphysis pubis. So this is going to come up, and that's going to that's going to allow for a little bit more room for that shoulder to come out. Meanwhile, what you're doing is you're applying pressure above the pubic symphysis. We call this suprapubic pressure, and that's kind of pushing the shoulder out. So these two are typically done together, McRoberts maneuver and suprapubic pressure. And this is successful. When done together, it's successful a little bit more than half of the time. So pretty good success rate with that. Okay, so this is what shoulder dystocia looks like. The shoulder is wedged up against the back of the pubic symphysis. The shoulder should be down here more. So there's also something called the corkscrew maneuver. Uh, I'm not going to show you any pictures of that because it's not good, not high yield for the test. But in this case, what you're doing is you're rotating the shoulders to a more transverse position, kind of making them a little bit more diagonal, uh, so you reduce the uh, you reduce the the diameter of the presenting part, so to speak. And then there's other things that you can do, episiotomy. You can attempt to deliver the posterior shoulder first. You can break the clavicle to make things a little bit more flexible. And then there's always an emergent C-section. These things are not done as often. Episiotomy is, but these other things are not done very often because of the morbidity that comes with it. The big complication that comes with shoulder dystocia is herbs palsy. Got to know that for the test. Herbs palsy and shoulder dystocia. So what is Herb's palsy? So Herb's palsy is caused from excessive pulling on the shoulder, which is going to be something that you're going to do a lot of when you try to deliver a baby with shoulder dystocia. And what happens is you injure the brachial plexus. In particular, you're injuring the uh, C5 and C6, this upper trunk here. And C5 and C6 are what give innervation to the suprascapular nerve, which innervates the supraspinatus and infraspinatus. Those are responsible for arm abduction and for, uh, for interior rotation of the arm. Uh, then the musculocutaneous nerve up here, and that innervates the biceps brachii, which uh, is responsible for flexing the elbow and for supination, so turning your hand from palm down to to palm up. And then also the axillary nerve, which is uh, going to innervate uh, the muscles of the shoulder, and those are responsible for abduction of the arm. So what you wind up with with Herb's palsy is an arm that can't extend and can't pronate. And so you get this. Okay? The, the arm is held adducted and it's held with, uh, with pronation. And so here you have what's called a waiter's tip deformity. It's like a waiter walking by a table with his hand out behind him uh, to get his tip. Okay, and this is how Herb's palsy shows up. Okay, the waiter's tip deformity. And what you'll do to manage this, there's you can put them in a sling to allow healing. Babies heal really well. Or there's surgical things that can be done. Okay. You see a lot of lawyers on TV and stuff that do suing for herbs palsy and stuff, which is really sad because if you don't do some of these aggressive maneuvers, the baby could die. Uh, but nonetheless, they're going to go after you and sue you. Lawyers are freaking leeches. One of my best friends is a lawyer. I shouldn't say that, but he knows how I feel about them. Okay, uterine rupture. So this is not only a complication of labor, but this is actually one of the chief causes of late pregnancy bleeding. Uh, bleeding is a prominent sign of uterine rupture. So uterine rupture is a complete separation of the wall of the uterus. And the most commonly associated uh, risk factor with uterine rupture is scarring from a classical caesarean incision. This is why we don't do classical incisions. Classical incisions are where you go vertical when you cut into the uterus. 
Normally now, in this country, when we do C-sections, we do a low transverse incision. So we go horizontally. And the good thing about that is that it allows the mother to be able to have a vaginal uh, delivery with subsequent uh, pregnancies. It also reduces her risk in general of having uterine rupture at any point during her pregnancy. Uh, but a classical vertical incision is a big risk factor for uterine rupture, and this is why we don't allow women who've had a vertical incision to do vaginal deliveries afterwards, because when that uterus is contracting, she's at significant risk for uterine rupture. So uterine scarring, typically from C-section, but also could be from trauma, from instrumentation, or from elective abortion. Elective abortion, a lot of times they'll do a DNC uh, or a DNE, and that's instrumentation. And so you can get scarring from that, and that weakens the wall of the uterus and puts you at risk for subsequent rupture. A myomectomy, uh, excessive uterine stimulation, uterine anomalies, a history of invasive molar pregnancy, a history of placenta percreta or increta, which is where the placenta uh, migrates too far into the wall of the uterus, male presentation, fetal anomaly, and cocaine abuse. The ones that you really want to remember are the ones that I underlined here. Uterine scarring, history of myomectomy, and excessive uterine stimulation. Uh, so that's where you give things to augment labor like uh, pitocin, oxytocin, uh, Cytotec or misoprostol, and Cervidil, uh, which is, I believe, dinoprostone. So the symptoms of uterine rupture, this classically comes up on the test, these symptoms of uterine rupture. However, the most reliable symptom of uterine rupture is fetal distress. So you look and you see bradycardia or uh, late decelerations on your fetal heart tracing. That's the most re reliable sign of uterine rupture. But a lot of times on the test, in, in, in real life, you'll see these symptoms. Uh, so a, a, a significant pain. Now, if mom has had a spinal and uh, or an epidural, she may not feel that. Okay, so that's why that might not be reliable. There may be a popping sensation, or notably hemorrhage. Uh, mom can become hemodynamically unstable. Her blood pressure may drop. Heart rate increases. Uh, cessation or abnormalities of contraction. So if the contractions stop, or they become more frequent but weaker tachycystole, and a loss of fetal station. Why? Because the uterine, uterus ruptures. There's room now for the baby to, to go elsewhere, so it may migrate into the abdominal cavity, and the head then is going to come back up. So it's a loss of station. Uh, that is a sign of uterine rupture. But as mentioned, the most reliable sign is fetal distress. The management Emergent C-section. If you have any reason whatsoever to suspect uterine rupture, mom is going in for a C-section. That's to save her life and to save the life of the baby. And then you also want to do a C-section because if she's had a uterine rupture, you want to get that repaired right away. Because if you can't repair it, or mom is hemodynamically unstable and you need to just stop the bleeding right away, you'll need to do a hysterectomy. You don't need to do a hysterectomy in all cases, but if mom is hemodynamically unstable, in order to save her life, you need to do a hysterectomy. But we try to repair it. If she doesn't have any desire to have future children, and this is why it's always good to know this in advance, but if she doesn't have any desire to have children again, uh, then just go ahead and do the hysterectomy. It's easier than doing a repair. So if you get on a test question, mom does not want any future children, then the answer to how to manage uterine rupture is emergency section and hysterectomy. Okay, and then we're going to talk about obstetrical laceration. So this is not necessarily anything going wrong per se, because these things happen spontaneously and almost normally. Okay, so anytime you have a big huge baby head coming out your vagina, you're going to have problems with the, the tissue because while the cervix and vagina are designed to deliver babies, the baby's head is still big, and you can get some trauma to the tissue. So obstetrical lacerations are classified according to their extent. And you'll, you'll want to know the difference between these. So a first-degree tear, you don't see a whole lot of. Okay, so that's where you just have a tear of the perineal mucosa. Second-degree and third-degree tears are what you see most commonly. 
Second degree tears is where the perineal body musculature is disrupted, but it does not extend to the rectal sphincter. I would say this is probably the most common, this is a second degree tear. The third degree tear is where the perineal mucosa, the perineal body musculature, uh, and the rectal sphincter are torn, but it doesn't go all the way through the rectal sphincter. And then a fourth degree tear goes all the way from the vaginal mucosa all the way down to the rectal mucosa, so a full tear. So just to show you a picture, this is a first degree tear, so it only affects the perineal mucosa. This is a second degree tear going down into the perineal musculature. And then this is a third degree tear, it's going into the rectal sphincter muscle here. And then this is a fourth degree tear, it goes all the way through the rectal sphincter, and now you have basically communication between the vagina and the rectum. So the complications, I should note right away, with a fourth degree tear is a rectovaginal fistula. And that's particularly if you don't repair it properly. So you have disruption of the tissue here. If you don't repair it properly, you'll get burrowing in between the rectum and the vagina. And the woman will note that she has poop in her vagina, and that's never, obviously, normal. So what you're going to do to manage this, and typically you're going to see second degree tears, but either way, whatever you see, you're going to repair these by layers. Okay, So you don't want to just do the skin and just go willy-nilly and, and, and suture whatever part to whatever part. You want to repair these in layers, so stitch muscle to muscle, perineum to perineum, skin to skin. Uh, so you'll repair with careful suturing, do this under sterile conditions, even though there may be contamination, you'd still do it under sterile conditions, and then you treat the pain with NSAIDs and SITS baths. Okay, and then finally, the episiotomy. Episiotomies used to be very common, they used to do them routinely, uh, and they thought because they will help avoid some of the more severe lacerations. Since the 80s and 90s, we don't do them that much anymore. Only about 10% of deliveries are accompanied by episiotomies. You're only really going to do episiotomies when there's problems, like shoulder dystocia, you may do an episiotomy. There's two ways you can do an episiotomy, the midline episiotomy and the medial lateral episiotomy. The midline episiotomy both have, by the way, uh, advantages and drawbacks. So the midline episiotomy is not done that often anymore. Why? Because it goes too close to the rectal sphincter. Uh, and you have a, a risk of fourth degree laceration. But the midline episiotomy, the advantage to it is it's less painful. And there's less bleeding. The medial lateral episiotomy has the benefit of not going so close to the rectal sphincter. But the problem is that it's a little bit more painful and there's a little bit more bleeding. We do the medial lateral episiotomy because we figure women can deal with a little bit more pain uh, if it means that they have a, less, a, a lesser chance of serious complications. And most women would agree they'd rather take the risk of having a little bit more pain to not have as big a risk of having a rectovaginal fistula and uh, incontinence of stool, which are complications of a, uh, of a fourth degree tear. Okay, so the medial lateral episiotomy is done more often, but we don't do episiotomies as frequently as we used to. Okay, and that is all I have for you for obstetrical complications during labor. I will see you next time.